Hi, my name is Brian Caffo, and this is the second lecture of the Executive Data Science Specialization course on Data Analysis in Real Life. So in this lecture, I'd like to talk about machine lear learning versus traditional st statistics just to orient you to the, the way I think about the difference between the two and why most of what I'm going to talk about in the subsequent lectures really applies to more traditional statistics. But it also somewhat applies to machine learning, and in this lecture I'll tell you the difference, or at least how I perceive the difference. In this lecture, we'd like to contrast machine learning versus more traditional statistics, because some of what, we, uh, some of what we're going to cover in subsequent lectures is universally applicable to both. However, some of it is really more oriented toward traditional statistical analysis. And in this lecture, I'm going to tell you kind of what I perceive to be the difference between the two. So it's very kind of oriented toward my impressions. So here's my sort of boilerplate bifurcation of these two styles of analyses. So to me, machine learning really emphasizes things like predictions. And so it tends to evaluate performance via prediction performance. And we'll go through some examples later on. So there's a lot of concern in machine learning for overfitting. That's fitting way too complex of a model, but, but not model complexity per se. If you do good prediction and you're not overfitting, then it's OK to have a rather complex model in machine learning. So the emphasis is on performance and automated learning. Um, and generalizable is, generalizability is usually obtained through performance of the algorithm on novel data sets. So machine learning tends to be a very data-oriented discipline. So if you want to discuss that your, your machine learning algorithm is generalizable, usually there's a sort of show-me attitude in machine learning. Get a new data set and apply it to that. And there's usually no super, super population model specified. So there's no this, my data is a sample from a larger population, and I'm thinking of it this way through statistical assumptions. And there's a lot of concern over performance and robustness, okay? So co let's contrast this with traditional statistical analysis. So traditional statistical analysis focuses on so-called superpopulation inference. We have a data set. We're going to assume that that data set is a sample from a larger population that we're interested in. And it tends to focus on a priori hypotheses, that your hypotheses are specified a priori. Um, and in general, there's this principle of parsimony in traditional statistical analyses. And that's basically saying, all else being equal, the simpler model is going to be preferred over a more complex model. And I would go even further that most traditional statisticians would say, even if you take a ding on, on prediction performance, even if your model isn't performing that well, you can, you can, you'd rather have a simpler model than a complex model, unless the difference in performance is extreme. And you, in traditional statistical analysis, you emphasize parameter interpretability a lot, uh, in contrast to machine learning, where you may have lots and lots of parameters in your, in your model, your algorithm, that you don't really care about those individual parameters. But in a regression analysis, for example, you care about the slope, every one of the slopes. So, the other superpopulation inference, so typically we have a statistical model that connects our data to this superpopulation. That's, that's the crux of statistical modeling. So some sort of statistical model, or even in non-parametric settings or robust settings, we often have sampling assumptions that connect our data to the population. And so just like machine learning, there's concern over robustness, but there's also this large concern over these set of statistical assumptions that connect our data to the population. So let's go through some examples. Uh, and I picked mostly prediction examples. And then I'm going to talk, if I were to have approached this problem as a traditional statistical analysis, what I would have done. So one of the most famous prediction problems in recent years was the Netflix prize. And in the Netflix prize, teams competed to produce the best recommender system for the company Netflix. So they wanted to recommend to users new movies that they might like through the, their star rating system. The Netflix prize was interesting because it was a million dollar prize. And um, some, some good friends of the team here actually won, a, a, a close friend, Chris Valencia, a great data scientist who works at AT&T. So 
the goal of this prize uh, and his team won. Uh, the goal of this prize was to um, build a machine learning algorithm that produced these recommendations. So you wanted it to be automated. You wanted it to be something that could be adaptive, that maybe could relearn the algorithm as needed. And you would define success as anything that produced reliable recommendations. And you can check that be, by when people watch a movie and actually then subsequently rate it. If they rate it high, then it was a good recommendation. If they rate it low, then it was a poor recommendation. So that's the goal of the machine learning analysis. But what if you were to approach this same problem with a traditional statistical analysis? Well, rather than building an algorithm, what you would want to do is build a parsimonious and interpretable model to better understand why people cho choose the movies that they do. So you'd be much more interested in what ex were the sample of people that you were interested in, were they representative of the totality of Netflix users? Or if you wanted to generalize not just to Netflix new users in general, but to movie watchers in general, you'd want to know to what extent are my Netflix users in my sample representative of the larger population of movie watchers in general. Okay, so in this case, you would be building probably smaller models. You would be trying to get very interpretable results, interpretable parameters, and you would define success as anything true that was learned about movies choices. So if you learned that certain demographics like certain kinds of movies, or you learn that people who, you know, psychological reasons why people like certain movies or anything that was true and parsimonious learned about movie choices would be the hopeful result, the hopeful success of such a statistical analysis, even if you didn't gain any better prediction, right? You can learn something true, but that may not really help you with prediction. Another example that I was involved in was the Heritage Health Prize. So this was actually a slightly bigger in terms of the monetary um, payout um, uh, prediction competition. In this case, the goal was to take previous years, previous couple of years, insurance claims and try and predict how long a person would spend in the hospital in subsequent years. So if you, for example, just because we spent a lot of time on this prediction, an example, one that we found, was, for example, if a woman was in the hospital for a hospital stay for a baby, then two years later, they had a higher, uh, they were more likely to be in the hospital again, uh, just because they, a lot of people tend to have babies about two years apart, right? And so that was an example of a predictor. So for among women with uh, uh, having had a hospital stay for having a child two years previous, they had a slightly increased prediction of being in the hospital two years subsequently. And then there were some other obvious ones, you know, for example, people who were in for cardiac problems and things like that tended to have an elevated risk of being in the hospital the next year. So at any rate, the machine learning algorithm for this problem, which we spent a lot of time building, was to, uh, basically to build an automated system for predicting hospital stays. So you'd want, if you were a hospital or a provider or something like this, uh, you would want to know from the collection of previous claims that you have, what ex exactly, how long people would spend in the hospital in subsequent years. And you could evaluate that. You Again, like most things, you would want the system to be able to relearn itself over time as things change. And you'd want it to be robust. And, but success would be anything that produces reliable predictions. And anything that produces more reliable predictions is better than, than, than something that produces less reliable predictions. And you could come up with a pretty simple formula to define what you meant by good predictions. By the way, in this case, I think we got 12th. We were listed as 14th, but two other teams got disqualified. So we came up with 12th. And it was, um, you know, this was a three year prediction competition or two year prediction competition. And by the end, we, things got pretty grim. We have to come up with a prediction every single day. And boy, were we tired of building prediction algorithms by the end. So I would just give you as a caveat, if you ever intend to enter in one of these competitions, think a year later down the road if you want to be building predictions every single day. Um, so 
let's now contrast what I would have done if instead of engaging in this prediction competition, if I had been interested in the science of insurance claims and hospital stays. Well, then I would want to do, perform a more traditional statistical analysis. I'd want to build a parsimonious and interpretable model. And I would want to figure out things like what I mentioned earlier about the issue with the pregnant women. Now, that probably wouldn't be terribly of interest to scientists or medical practitioners or anyone because it's just a kind of quirky little, it's just a demographic fact, really. Um, but you, you might want to learn if there's certain combinations of the claims that might lead to a greater propensity for hospital stays, which might then lead to the ability to, to treat people earlier. So success in this case would be anything that was learned about hospital stays from insurance claims data. Another very famous prediction example uh, was the Google flu trends. This, this came out um, several years ago and it was a very, uh, it, it generated a lot of excitement. And here, the very clever people uh, at Google came up with the idea that well, they could tr maybe detect flu outbreaks before the Centers for Disease Control by looking at search terms and geographic information associated with the search terms. So if lots of people were searching for Tamiflu or you know, searching for headaches and fevers, et cetera, that might lead to a greater uh, propensity or a greater risk that the a flu outbreak in that particular area where most of the searches were coming from. So in this case, their goal was to build an automated system for predicting flu outbreaks. And their success was anything that produces reliable predictions as judged by the more, um, the more thorough information that came out from the CDC, but much slower. So their goal was to beat the CDC in terms of, uh, of time, but then they, they had the, the high quality data coming in a little bit later to actually validate their algor algorithm. So contrast this with what flu researchers, like I'm in the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, that flu researchers here do all the time. They want to better understand flu outbreaks. So they want to build models that helps us understand specifically why flu outbreaks uh, you know, occur in certain areas. So for them, search terms probably wouldn't be enough. They, they, they need more of the kind of information that the CDC, for example, was collecting, which includes um, prescriptions for t actual prescription counts for Tamiflu and that sort of thing. So again, so all these examples really emphasize in my, in my mind kind of this big dividing line between what is typically going on in a machine learning experiment versus what's typically going on in a traditional statistical experiment. So I hope what I've emphasized in this lecture is that both approaches are extremely valuable and they have their place. However, typically the amount of model complexity and assumptions and et cetera differs quite a bit between the two approaches. So their goal, and because their goals are very different. And I would just end this, this part of the discussion with a little caveat that says, well, the, 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 there's um, the machine learning community I've noticed has started to build super population models to evaluate their algorithms. And so they're kind of connecting it to traditional statistics. In addition, there's been a lot of work on making machine algorithm output, in addition to producing these ultra high quality predictions, making them uh, much more interpretable. It, I've also seen a lot of people taking traditional statistical approaches and building them up slightly in terms of complexity to try and uh, produce better predictions. So it's interesting that in a lot of ways, the two areas are meeting in the middle and these distinctions that I've outlined a lot in this lecture, that I am outlining a lot in this lecture, are getting grayed quite a bit.